Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. Hello again from my backyard patio in late August 2020 in Buffalo, New York. I just watched a stunning sunset over a beach at Lake Erie, and I'm feeling a little nervous, perhaps, about the impending seasonal shift that will bring a new bite to the air in the coming weeks. But I am an outdoorsy person, and I will pursue this seasonal shift with running miles, hikes, cozy sweaters, and some good movies. Speaking of movies, the topic of this episode is the book Religion and Film, Cinema and the Recreation of the World by Dr. Brent Plate. The book is out now from Columbia University Press. Religion and Film seeks out the frames, foci, and bodily engagements that are central to both cinema and religious practice. Dr. Plate and I discuss his entry into being interested in film and art, how that interest came to be entwined with the academic study of religion, and then we discuss in great detail the ways films and religion are constructed and dive deeply into the concept of world-making. This is a conversation full of joy and relevant topics to almost any listener, whether they be interested in film, religion, or both. Dr. Brent Plate is a writer, editor, and visiting associate professor of religious studies at Hamilton College. His books include Representing Religion in World Cinema, Blasphemy, Art That Offends, and more. The major topic of this episode is his book, Religion and Film, Cinema and the Recreation of the World. You can find Dr. Plate online at sbrentplate.net and on Twitter at splate1. That's the number one, by the way. As always, you can find me on Twitter at classical underscore ideas. I really hope you enjoy this conversation. It was an absolute blast for me to have. So without further delay... Please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Brent Plate. Dr. Brent Plate, welcome to Classical Ideas. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Great to be on the show. It's, uh, it's delightful to have you. I'm super excited today to talk about your work, religion, film, and all the things that you have done um, throughout the course of your career. This is a topic area that I have never really touched on much within the show, so I'm excited to talk about this intersection between media and religion with you. But before we go into that, I'm wondering if you can just sort of introduce yourself to the audience however you see fit. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you today from um, my home in uh, the middle of New York State, very rural place. Uh, I live out in, the, out in the middle of nowhere. I teach at Hamilton College usually. I'm a professor by special appointments at Hamilton College of Religious Studies and Cinema and Media Studies. Um, I will I'm actually on the beginnings of a two-year leave from Hamilton I'll be at Colgate in the fall, uh, taking up the uh, Burke Chair of Regional Studies, going to be teaching on sort of the religions of central New York uh, in the fall. And then we'll be taking the next uh, next few semesters after that off. I got an ACLS fellowship to do some writing uh, of a new book, and uh, maybe we can talk about that a little bit later on. Um, so yeah, so I'm sort of in between a couple of things. I'm also in between, uh, editing gigs. Uh, I've been working with the journal Material Religion for, uh, 16 years now. And, uh, at the end of 2020, I'll be stepping down and, uh, we'll be stepping into the editorship of the journal Cross Currents, which is, uh, a journal that's been around since, uh, 1950 mm. and has moved, uh, through a number of different kind of, changes and incarnations. It goes way back, you know, publishing the work of Paul Tillich and Martin Buber and uh, Hannah Arendt back in the 50s and 60s wow. into feminist theology and liberation theology and published, you know, early works in James Cone and black theology, and Cornell West and on into interreligious work and LGBTQ theologies, echo theologies, uh, spiritualities. Um, so it's just an exciting uh, new thing to take up. We're particularly 
focus towards the public and the public understanding of religion. So uh, it gives me a chance to kind of take on that side of things, which has always been important to me is how a religion gets, gets played out and enacted for better, or for worse in, in public settings. Um, so that's kind of, I'm kind of in between, in between universities right now and in between editing, I'm kind of overlapping and all these things. I feel a little lost in the midst of just staying home in the middle of the Corona pandemic and uh, locking down. Wow, Brent, you are a very prolific guy as well. You have a, a ton of books out over the years, and your your CV seems like you are a very adventurous scholar. You know what I mean? Like it feels like you are are always open to new opportunities, and that you like to explore all that your profession has to offer. It seems to me. Absolutely, yeah. No, thanks for that. I I do. I I'm endlessly curious and um, uh, adventurous. I, I that's a good uh, good term. I you know I just things i maybe you know maybe it's you know the downside I, maybe i'm just i get i'm impatient i get bored with things <laughs> so I work, on, work on something for a while like film i've been doing on and off for years and i kind of you know once i got the second edition out i you know got sort of you get invites then right to write chapters of you know write the film chapter on this handbook of such and such and i just have been refusing to to do anymore i just i'm not sure i have much more to say at this point mm. you know on the on the so sort of moving into other areas and thinking about other things. Um, and uh, yeah, so just, just kind of, I mean, that's the fun thing about academia too. There are just are so many fascinating little, little niches and, and things to discover. Um, just fun to read what my colleagues are coming up with and you just think, man, I've never, never thought of that. And you start reading their book and it just kind of blows you away. Um yeah, so what we'll do here today is I do want to get your your thoughts on religion and film, but I would like to build in a little bit of time at the end for you to um, you know, sort of verbalize what some of your future uh research agendas and writing projects may look like. So let's definitely uh hold some space at the end for some talk on some of your future endeavors cuz I definitely am curious to hear what's inspiring you these days. Um but as you mentioned, within the field, you are very well known for your scholarship on religion, film, and art. And I'd love to know a little bit about your life and your path of coming to appreciate film in general and like other creative works of art. Like, how did you come to be a fan of film and art in general? Like, go back as far as you need to. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, my grandmother. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've, I've actually been writing. This is one thing I've been writing about religion and film lately. It's sort of a personal essay on on film. Uh, my grandmother grew up in a fundamentalist church in Chicago. Uh, the preacher actually was a pretty prolific guy, fairly well known in fundamentalist circles, and he actually wrote a uh, wrote a little pamphlet called the the menace of the motion picture. You know, he was really against um, movies, as a lot mm. of fundamentalist. Pam- were at the time. Um, so she's growing up in 1920s and 1930s, the rise of, you know, Nickelodeons and just movie theaters are all over. And uh, she and her big sister would sneak out of church on Sunday morning, go down to the local uh, local theater, catch a movie and be back just in time for the closing hymn. Um, so I attribute a lot of my love of movies to my grandmother, who has uh, since passed on. Um, but, uh, she just, uh, you know, I think just always had that love of things. And, um, and I think for myself as well, just from an early age, I was brought up in a, in a conservative Protestant household. So I was never, the idea that religion is important, uh, was never an issue for me. It always mm. was important uh, in my family. I've, I've, you know, moved well away from the sort of credo of, of conservative Protestantism, but, um, I've retained that sense that religion is important in uh, in in people's lives. That it, that changes, and in fact, the environment I grew up in this was really the most important uh, constitutive element of who somebody was was their was their religion. Um, you know, there obviously problems with 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 working that way. I mean, there's sort of a denial of race and class and gender that that all gets elided within that. Um, but nonetheless, it, you know, I sort of continue to, to understand religion as this important, you know, it, it's a, yeah, we can critique it as a made up kind of colonial category, but I think it's a useful category, um, alongside our, our economic selves and our social selves and our artistic selves. Um, so yeah, so from the very beginning, uh, religion and religion and film have been really, you know, part of my life. And it, it wasn't until much later, uh, that I 
kind of realized somewhere in the middle of graduate school that I realized, hey, you can actually put these two things together and mm. think about both. Um, so yeah, so into the 1990s, as I'm in graduate school, I'm uh, realizing that, hey, I can I can write about film in a critical kind of way and think about its implications for uh, the study of religion. Um, and so, yeah, so I kind of pers- pursued that. Some of my first, you know, interests in, in really writing uh, were, were around film. Um, I did did sort of master's and, and Ph.D. dissertation on arts in general in relation to religion. I did some work on video art and uh, modern painting and things like that. So it's sort of an art history media studies training uh, alongside the sort of general history of religions. Uh, kind of training. Uh, but yeah, it was fun fun to be able to discover there were people writing about religion and film at the same time and realize, hey, I, I can do this. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's been a, been a good element. It's always been, I feel like, a side project of mine. It hasn't ever been necessarily what I always teach on, and it hasn't always been my central focus, but it's always been a side project, but it's it's turned out to be really kind of an important side project. Definitely. Um, I'm curious what kind of film you are inherently drawn to just as a fan of film and cinema in general. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I really I'm a big fan of uh, science fiction and and I guess we'd call speculative fiction. Mm. Um, I, I just I saw Star Wars, you know, when it was first out. I was 11 years old when it first came out and just was just completely blown away. I mean, I just I remember that summer when it was out and just. I watched it five times. You know, I was an 11-year-old. I got found my way into the theater five times that summer to watch Star Wars, uh, the original one. And, um, you know, just recently rewatched the, uh, you know, the most recent Rise of Skywalker. And, uh, you know, just I've always had this kind of place in my heart for them. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons people don't like these films, but I just just can enjoy them uh, in a lot of ways. Um, the Matrix, uh, I remember seeing that when it was out and sort of the whole trilogy there. Uh, but then also more more recent things like uh, Ex Machina, Alex Garland film, Ex Machina, which I think is really brilliant kind of um, film, but I think got some good good publicity but uh, maybe isn't as well known and then uh more avant-garde people like chris marker the french filmmaker chris marker way back to la jete in the 1960s and on up into um uh level five i think that's probably from the 1990s or so now markers marker died some time ago um but these kind of you know they're not like level five i remember just you know probably nobody's nobody none of the listeners have heard of that but uh, it's just had some really kind of thoughtful ways of thinking about the future, you know, and sort of the speculative kinds of ways and something about these films that you can, you can create this world and you sort of see this, you know, maybe a futuristic world. Um, and, uh, just uh, challenges our conceptions of what, you know, what if, you know, what, what could happen if such and such happened. Um, but that, but I'm also very much kind of a fan of, uh, of sort of what they call the mumble core, uh, Noah Baumbach and Greta Gerwig, uh, probably the two biggest exemplars of it these days. Um, just really love movies like uh, like Lady Bird and, and Gerwig's uh, Little Women, uh, Noah Baumbach's recent Marriage Story, uh, things like that. And then the precursors, of course, I mean, it's just straight out of Woody Allen and Ingmar Bergman and just these conversation heavy things. But it's also going to have a sense of humor for me. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of too serious. Uh, you know, for a while when I was getting into film, when I was a college student, I'd watch all these European art house films. And, you know, there's a lot of it that I really, really like Antonioni and Bergman and, and folks like that and Tarkovsky. But then there's just part of me that's just like, this is just too serious. You know, there's no humor in it. It's mm. almost like there are so many of them just fail to see humor in life. And um, I mean, Fellini, I love because Fellini can just just be sarcastic about things <laughs> and just cynical. And I, I kind of love that kind of surrealist dimension, but then others are just like so, so serious, and and it just is inhuman, I think, to be so serious um, mm. artwork like that. So I've always been drawn to that 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 dose of humor. Something's got to have a good dose of humor in it. Uh, which again, I, Star Wars, I think, sort of does that kind of very dryly. And sort of, there's a lot of science fiction that's just too serious all the time. But I think Star Wars certain ways some of the writing they're just these corny little jokes in the midst of things that um you know that i think just kind of endears them to me i, I like the, the way it does that yeah so well that's, that's the range yeah 
Yeah, so and I'm, I'm loving the fact that you brought up speculative fiction as well because um, – there's a lot of religion that gets tied into stuff like that. Like I'm thinking, for example, of the book A Canticle for Leibowitz um, or mm. something like that, which has so much religion tied in. And I'm curious if you have any ideas on how like, some of your favorite films have any religious characteristics like built into them that people who aren't embedded in your field of work would overlook. How are these films like tying in like religious characteristics in general? Yeah, that's good. Uh, good question. I mean, I mean, there's the obvious with Star Wars and the Force, right? That becomes more and more prominent in the later, in the later iterations of it. You have these sacred texts and this kind of ultra-like spaces and things like that in the uh, later episodes of Star Wars. Um, but I think there's a lot more like I, Ex Machina. You know, uh, is a I think a, a good. Maybe some of it's fairly obvious, but um, you know, there's this paradise like place they're out in the middle of nature uh this you know the 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 ai that's the the main character in it is um her name is ava you know sort of eve and um it's you know it's just constantly reiterating and there's so many of them i actually if you look into so what was it wally right the the animated film wally right you have Mm. ava in there well, you know, the figure of Eve and, and Adam, maybe a little less so, but the figure of Eve is, is so prominent across so many of these films um, that, you know, we're just we're recapitulating all these mythologies, you know, the same sort of myth. It's retold, I mean, which are all myths are retellings of earlier myths and they're retellings of earlier myths. Um, so I, I find, you know, in them these sort of doses of mythology, these doses of ritual. Um and so, yeah, there's these uh, there's these characteristics, but I think the, the I think the general thing and part of what I tried to get out in the early chapters in the in my religion and film book was the way cinematography and editing sort of create this um, cosmic worldview, right? So there's a um, you know it can be an atheistic filmmaker or a secular filmmaker, and the first shot you know, the camera is looking up into the heavens, right? You see clouds, you see stars, you see something going on up above, and then the camera tilts down to the earth, right? Mm-hmm. And it's setting up the cosmological, you know, this, this cosmic framework for understanding this film. And and it happens across films. I've, I've actually got clips from a, literally a, you know, at least a dozen different films, totally different genres, children's stories, uh, you know, beginning of Star Wars begins that way. Uh, Blue Velvet, I mentioned in the book, um, you know, so surrealism, comedy, children's animation, science fiction, um, are constantly sort of playing with this cosmic, worldview right here's the world here's the heavens up above and here's us down below yeah. and there's some between the two so it's it's just on this purely visual term right they're, they're usually not talked about it's just the, it's the opening shots um so it's you know it doesn't have to be about mythology it doesn't have to be about any particular things but they're they're reiterating a, uh, a certain worldview or a, a you know universal kind of view of things just through the visual movement of the camera yeah. Okay, so you brought up the book Religion and Film, Cinema and the Recreation of the World, of which the second edition is out now. Um, so let's dive into this book. Um, so really quick, just for folks who aren't aware of this book, what is the general premise that you landed on for the original first edition that you went with as the premise of the book? Hmm. Yes, the idea of world making um, and the, the idea that religions, I came across this, I was teaching with uh Bill Payton, William Payton at the University of Vermont back in the 19, uh, 1999, I actually showed up there and uh, picked up his book, uh, Religious Worlds, uh, from the 1990s, um, and sort of became a kind of useful introductory textbook that I used to use a lot of times in introductory classes. But it really kind of, it kind of stated some things for me that I just kind of clarified um things that I've been thinking about, but it just kind of solidified them for me. But this idea that religions are about worlds, right? It's not just a set of beliefs. It's not just a set of behaviors. It's not just stories. It's not just rituals. It's this, it's a world that's created. And the idea that there are multiple worlds, right? We live within, and we, we, we actually cross over as humans. We cross over worlds. We might live in actually a couple of different worlds um, and, and have to toggle back and forth. Um, this idea that religion is uh, is part of a world making system, and of course a lot of that goes back to um, uh, Peter Berger and uh, Sacred Canopy, 
uh, where he, from 1966, where he's talking about world creation and world maintenance, you know, these two kind of key things. Um, so between sort of Hayden and, and kind of rereading per, Peter Berger's ideas, that it's just kind of reframed my sense of how religion operates. And it really quickly began to see film in the same kind of way. What they're, what, what I'm, so the basic premise is that religions and movies try to create worlds for people and they invite, they make them appealing. Uh, they make them alluring in various ways. So we want to enter into those worlds and participate within the worlds. Uh, so it's a bodily experience as well. It's a sensual experience. We see it, we hear it, we taste it, we touch it, right? Rituals and stories and all these uh, sets, even, even our beliefs are sort of constructed around the way our bodies move in these spaces. So that was something similar I saw within them within cinema as well, right? Cinema, you know, a good movie pulls you, you know, keeps you on the edge of your seat. You know, literally it's our bodies are, are moving into this kind of thing. Um, and it's appealing to our senses. Um, so I, that kind of, that kind of hinge, you know, it allowed me to kind of think back and forth between religion and, and cinema systems, how they, uh, how they create worlds for people and how people are invited uh, into those worlds to become part of them, to become participants, right? Mm. We're not just view, viewers, right? In religion or the movies. I mean, we say we go for escape, but that's, we don't, you know, no such thing as escape in cinema We're we're pulled into, we're pulled into a world or we might not be. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe a terrible film or we just aren't in the mood for it. And we just, we don't get into it, but the same is true, right? With religion, we just, you know, I don't want, that's boring, you know, yeah. <laughs> who wants to go sit for an hour on Sunday morning, um, do anything like that. So that's the, that's the kind of hinge there is this world making idea. Well, and I really, I'm glad you brought up Peyton too, because he blurbed the book on the back cover, and I actually got a lot out of his blurb, because he writes, setting aside the customary approach of simply analyzing religious themes in movies, this volume compares mythic and ritual ways of constructing a world with cinematic processes, such as framing, focus, editorial selection, lighting, camera angle, voice, use of time, and space, and iconicity. Um, so I really like the way he framed that because, you know, as an outsider to your personal profession, this is a way of helping me see what is happening and making direct links between what you're saying in the book. So Payton's blurb was actually super helpful to me pre-reading your book. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And he, yeah, he gets the, yeah, which is fun. You know, he, he certainly, uh, um, you know, implicitly in some places. Actually, I mean, I, I do quote him plenty of places in the book, but uh, it was great to be able to, you know, have him blurb it like that. So, you know, as so, someone who really got, and, you know, Bill never really wrote much on film. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure, not sure if he ever, ever really has written on film, but, um, you know, to, for someone to kind of get that, I think from his, you know, comparative comes out of a strong comparative religions, uh, perspective to to get what I was doing there was really you know a happy moment for me for sure well yeah and I want to get into a few of these concepts a little more deeply but um before we get into a few more specific things uh, what led you to doing a second edition of this book because I'm always curious why scholars and authors do a second edition on books and what that process looks like Mm, yeah, right. So I, the first one came out in 2009. It was with the Film Studies Press Wallflower based in London. And it's a great little Film Studies Press. Um, do just done some really, really great work. But it was in a series called Shortcuts. And these were all, um, I think they, they were all capped at 144 pages, you know, which was a fairly, fairly short book. Um, and they had, you know, themes like uh, women in film, um, religion and film, philosophy and film. It was all these sort of this, this, this and film um, kind of thing. And great, uh, great series. I, I think it's, I think it's still going. Um, Columbia Press then uh, distributed Wallflower in the U.S. And um, sort of through that, after, after time went on, I realized, you know, it was just, there was so much, so many other things I wanted to kind of add to uh, the book, you know, wasn't able to sort of say as much as I wanted to in that, in that shortcut series. Uh, so, you know, talked to in some conversations with Columbia University Press and, you know, what about a second edition just sort of expands on it quite a bit. And it is, it, you know, and it 
turns out that, you know, I added a couple, couple whole chapters, revamped some of the chapters that were there. Um, so it's about, I think it's about 50% longer oh, than, wow. the, than the original. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty significant different book in, in many ways, the, the second edition. Um, so, so yeah, it allowed me to uh, expand on kind of the three part in the first one. I think I had kind of a idea of like the first couple chapters sort of filtered over, uh, but then it was sort of a quick chapter on sort of religion afterwards, after, uh, you know, the, there's a, well, we'll talk about that in a minute, before film, during film, and after film. And uh, the first one was really just about before film and then a little bit on the after film. Um, so I wanted to fill in some section on the what happens during the actual watching of film. And uh, so, yeah, so it worked, worked really well to work with uh, Columbia University Press on that and to do that. Of course, not, you know, not, I mean, just to say not everybody does that for second editions. I mean, I've, I've seen plenty of second editions of books that all they do is add a new preface to it and, uh, you know, kind of restamp it. Um, and uh, there may be just popular books from the past and they just, the press said, hey, let's just update this. And so they do a, do a quick once over. Mine, mine is a pretty radical. And I, I think I tried to say it's not just a second edition, but it's a uh, second expanded edition. That's awesome. Well, I want to dive yeah. a little bit more into that main premise that you talked about with world making. And I want to tie in religion and cinema as world making because you describe both of those as world making um this is a term i've heard a lot when thinking about books like you know the classic lord of the rings or something today by brandon sanderson or something like that i'm wondering if you can break down in religious and also cinematic ways what world making is and are and if those two religious and cinematic world making are different Mm. Yeah, good, good question. I've, so I, so I'm, you know, again, I'm coming at it from kind of a formalist, uh, even aesthetic perspective. I'm interested in these kind of formal structures of how it, how you know, what we call film form. You know, what is the cinematography, the editing, the mise en scène? You know, that is all the sort of components that are going on in a scene. You know, the color, the clothing, the props. Uh, everything that you see on a scene, so the sort of theatrical component of it. Um, so I'm interested in sort of analyzing on the, these, you know, film studies has nicely broken these things down for us. And we can we can think about, um, you can go through a film and just look at editing. You can just count, you know, how many times there's a cut. And what, what is the cut? What is the next cut? Where does it go to? Uh, what is that, you know, telling us? There's a, you know, semiotics to it. There's a language that happens yeah. when you, when you, um, cut in certain ways and juxtapose two images. Right? The, the Soviets uh, in the 1920s were really, you know, keen. I really sort of invented this sort of sense of juxtaposition. Uh, people like Eisenstein and Vertov and, and others, Pudok, um, they were all, um, you know, masters at this. And uh, we sort of inherited that. So there's a so there's a formal way that these worlds are made. You, you juxtapose images with each other and you, you recreate, you know, otherwise realistic scenes. You put one thing next to another and you've, you've recreated both of those, both of those images in the first place. So I think there's, you know, so, so cinema has these kinds of, you know, general forms. They, they are, are uh, let's say techniques, uh, editing, cinematography, mise-en-scene, you know, three of the key ones. Um, and, and so religions have this similar kind of thing. If I'm looking at it this way, and you know, obviously I'm not the only one to have said this, but we work uh, in religious studies with things like rituals and myths and symbols and, and doctrines and maybe sacred texts and, uh, and the like there. So these are our tools to make worlds within, uh, within religions. And um, so religious studies sort of goes and, and, and analyzes those things, analyze the rituals, analyze the myths, analyze the symbols. Um, so both, so both, you know, they're not equal to each other. I mean, editing doesn't totally equal, uh, say, ritual, but there's some interesting parallels going on. It's about a breakup of how time and space are broken up, you know, going back to these very basic, both cinema and film share space and time. Mm. Uh, these are the fundamental building blocks of, of human experience we experience things in space and we experience things in time um that time gets broken up as we were just talking about uh, before we started recording being on lockdown 
during the uh, COVID crisis is rearranged our sense of time. Yes. Right? We have a different time grant. It's not that the hours have changed. It's not, like, not that the Earth's rotation on its axis has actually changed. Actually, we might think we know it hasn't <laughs> yeah. changed. Uh, uh, the rotation around the sun hasn't actually changed, even though that's how we count our years and our days. But um, our experience of that, our human experience uh, of those things have changed. Um, so films and, and, and rituals change our experience of time. They interrupt our experience of time. They focus our time. Um, and then, of course, they also focus our, our sense of space, you know, where we are in things. A, a good film, even though it's a two-dimensional image, uh, you know, projected on a screen away from us, uh, a good film, of course, when we get into it, we, we get into it. We are, you know, we're there uh, in that world. It pulls us into it. And we, we feel like we're in another space. Sometimes, we, you know, you lose your sense of self and you don't, you don't think, oh, I'm sitting here in a theater right now in a theater seat. You, you feel like you're on, you know, Alderaan with yeah. Luke Skywalker, something like that, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so it, it, these are the components, the formal and aesthetic components. And I wanted to kind of break those down and say, you know, myths and rituals and symbols are kind of, you know, are rearranging space and time in the same way that cinematography, editing, and mise-en-scene are rearranging space and time. Yeah, well, and it seems like the the film version of uh, space and time is completely under the control of the people within the film studio sort of how like the flow of space and time is like completely under the control of like a Roshi or like a priest or mm -hmm. something like that within a, within a holy space. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There are, uh, there, they're sort of masters at these things. They know, they know how to, uh, they're master artists, you know, a good, uh, a good, you know, a, a good priest, a, a good cantor, a good um, muezzin, uh, you know, they, they have a sense for how things are going to appeal to people and they can they can do their performances. They can help mark the time. They might have a script, right, that they're, they're working from, right? I mean, that go to the Episcopal Church and, you know, here's a whole book on, you know, these are the rights. These are the, this is the format. This is the way you do it. But a, a good person who, who knows the liturgy can, can tweak that and kind of alter it a little bit, and slow things down and speed things up. Um, of course, in the same way a good editor can, uh, an editor can, um, you know, make things feel faster, even if it's a slow film might be able to, you know, put more cuts in and, and, and speed a film up. And that way, it, uh, again, it's still maybe a 90 minute film, but some film some films feel faster than others. Um, mm. Some rich feel faster than others. Um, so yeah, I think that's a that's a good good comparison. The the priest. Um, I mean, of course, there you know it's yeah. There's more to the control. It's uh, there's only so much a editor and a priest can do. Sure, sure. Uh, if, well, and earlier you mentioned another term, which you said goes back decades, and that's the concept known as the sacred canopy. And I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit on that and tell the listeners what you mean by that phrase and how it ties into world making within film. Yeah, so that's, you know, Chris, uh, taken directly from uh, Peter Berger's book of the, of the same name. And uh, so the, the idea is to take Berger's idea of the sacred canopy as this, you know, this idea that we humans, we project uh, you know, he's got that famous line in the book about um, religion being the audacious attempt to conceive of the entire universe as humanly significant or mm. you know, something, something along those lines. You know, it's this, uh, so the sacred canopy is this, we project meaning onto this, onto this universe out there. You know, we believe that the stars and the moon and the sun and, and the tides and the formation of mountains and uh, as well as our social life is is all about us and we're you know we're the ones who create meaning out of these things you know this is and we and then we of course we project we we attribute it to a to a single creator god we contribute it to uh, attribute it to the uh, to the certain spirits creator spirits um or uh you know different forces supernatural forces working in the world uh, but the idea is this sort of projection. So he uses the language of projection. Again, it's not talking about film, but he uses the language of projection, which, I, again, I find interesting, the language, the linguistic parallels that go on. Um, so the sacred canopy is this sort of projection. It's, uh, you know, and I, as I'm reading Berger, you know, 
some 25 years ago, whenever I first was uh, reading this, I'm, I'm picking up on all this language of framing and focusing and projecting. You know, these are all cinematic terms that he's using, uh, even though he's not at all talking about cinema. Um, mm. So I'm thinking of this canopy as this sort of, you know, get this idea of this big screen above our, you know, above our, you know, whatever, maybe our nation, our church, our, our mosque, uh, and we're sort of projecting this onto this, these images onto this canopy up above us. Um, and then, and then I begin to look at the, <laughs> the films themselves, and I realize, and again, I've got a series of clips like this I show to my students all the time. You look at the beginnings of films, so you go to Paramount or Columbia or Orion, now defunct Orion, DreamWorks, um, uh, BBC films, uh, Vivendi, um, you just go on and on, all these major film production studios. Their logos, right, these motion picture logos at the beginning are always projected up in space. They're always, there's clouds, there's stars, um, there's something going on up in space, and we kind of look up to it. You think about the uh, Columbia, Lady Columbia, sort of up on a mount, and what kind of the, the angle is we're looking up at her and she and she's framed by the sky and the clouds behind her. Right. So there's this. So these film production studios are very aware of the fact that they're creating a canopy for us as well. They're creating they're this intermediary between the heavens and the earth. Uh, they're the ones who are sort of suggesting, you know, we're you're, you're entering, in, entering into another world here. Um, you know, here's Lady Lady Columbia to guide you. Here's the uh, the logo Universal Pictures Studio, right? That's part of the best one, most prominent. You've got the Earth spinning, and then all of a sudden this this big word Universal sort of spans the globe, and you see this, you know, see all the lights of these cities come on as the globe uh, turns, as the Earth turns. Uh, you know, Universal. It's 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 sacred canopy right there. Yeah. You look at the the logo and the sacred canopy those i mean that just to me that just resonates so much with each other you know and so the film production studios are the ones suggesting we're creating these canopies these mm. meaningful for people uh to come together and to look up together uh you know in coordination with each other um yeah i love yeah, how you, so that, I, yeah sorry um i love how you divide the book religion and film into three separate sections of like the before, during, and after of the cinematic experience. And I want to talk a little bit about each one. What is the, what is religious about the before stage of cinema? Yeah, that's where we get back to the, what we're talking about the, the sort of the priests and the cinematographers, right? The, uh, this is the production of film. So there are these, there are these, uh, editors, there are these camera people, there are these directors, there are these producers, and they they have the script, and they're going to kind of create this world for us, and they put it together, and they've got experience of how to edit a film, how to how to do cinematography for a film, how to add color at certain places and take away color at certain places, how to add motion, how to add sound, how to uh, how to uh, affect us through sound, and they're they're creating the film. And they're creating, they're, they're meaning to create worlds there. And you've got to have, you know, a good film's got to have a good, good understanding of how editing works and how it functions in the, in the lives and bodies of people. Um, so that's the before is, mm. is that kind of, that kind of priestly um, um, kind of work, the priestly slash director's work, <laughs> uh, to put it that way. Um, and then you you did describe like you described a lot about the during as well throughout our conversation today. Is there anything else you'd like to elaborate on with regards to the during of cinema? Yeah, so the you know no matter how much uh, how great an editor is, uh, Thelma Shoemaker, uh, I think I quote her uh, a bit in the book. She's um, worked with Scorsese for you know a couple decades now. I think they've she's done edited most of Scorsese's films. Um, but she, uh, you know, so she talks about, you know, she and she and Marty will sit in a screening booth and, and go through sort of dailies and look at look at some of the raw footage and they, they would think about how to cut the film. And then they'll do it in front of uh, audiences, you know, they'll show a film and then they, they watch the audience. Right. They don't watch the film. They watch the audience watching the film. And they start to look at, you know, if someone starts to squirm a little bit or looks, you know, they can tell by body language of the people 
um, how the film is working for them or not working for them. And they'll adjust the film. They'll make little notes and say, ah, you know, you know, 15 minutes and 47 seconds into it, I saw people squirm. Mm. I saw people move, seem to be bored. So they're looking at bodies and the bodies are watching the film. So they're, you know, this is, this is what, you know, some of Schumacher is doing, uh, you know, which I think is just kind of a genius way to think about this. This is what happens during the film. During a film, people's bodies are moved uh, or not. Um, and, and no matter what the, you know, no matter what the priest does in the ritual, no matter what the director and the cinematographer and the editor are doing in the making of a film, um, people have their own responses. And there's only so much you can control for um, people are not, not everyone is going to like everything all the time. Um, so the people during the film bring their bodies to the film and they have reactions. They jump, you know, you go to a horror film and we all know the blood is fake, right? We all know that Freddy Krueger isn't a real person. Mm-hmm. He's an actor. On the screen. No one, no one, you know, you interview people before and after and they'll say, uh, no, he was, that was an actor playing Freddy Krueger. There's no such person. They will tell you that rationally but bring them into the theater and they'll, as soon as, you know, the, the killer jumps out from, you know, out of the bushes, everybody, you know, jumps back, you know, their bodies literally are moved by this fake two dimensional film. Um, and I, you know, I think that's, I think that's a way of explaining to what happens in religious experience and religious life. I mean, there's these sort of, you know, the atheists and neo-atheists sort of arguing, well, this is crazy. There's no such thing as God, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and can't understand it. Um, but then they go to the movies and they they they, they get scared by the movies. Um, you know, you, we don't live as rational creatures. Uh, we move, our bodies move in ways that our, that our minds aren't in control of. Um, and I think religion operates this way. We don't necessarily believe all these things that are being said in the in the in the middle of the religious uh, ceremonies, but um, you know we act as if it's happening, act as if it's real, act as if you know that that is real blood, uh, uh, real blood and and, and real wine, uh, real, right? Real body, real real blood, right? In the in the Christian communion or something like that, um, we act as if these things happen. Um, So the the during of cinema is really a a key component to it. We can't just analyze the films. We have to think about what's happening to the bodies of the people in the film. And they're Mm. making different kinds of meanings than the directors and the editors thought. I love that because it ties in the lived reality of individualized experiences. And I'm thinking of like a Pentecostal church where somebody is moved physically during, during church. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah definitely. Different Love that. ways. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it happens. So let's get into the after. In the book, you write about how film helps to reshape actual rituals in religion, which I found was so interesting. What are some of your favorite examples of ways that film alters religious ritual practice? Hmm. Yeah. The, you know, some of the examples I give are. Um, you know, bar mitzvahs or bat mitzvahs where uh, they've hired, you know, I, I think I write about them. This is, you know, sort of dated now, but Titanic, when Titanic was big, um, this girl had a Titanic themed bat mitzvah yeah. you know, for herself, sort of, you know, le- big picture of Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet together. <laughs> and this is, you know, the whole theme of it. So it's sort of, this is one way that it's sort of, you know, films have infiltrated our, our rituals. Um, you know, there, there's people who have uh, Star Wars based weddings, uh, Star Trek based weddings, you know, and you can, you can get married. And um, so I actually have one of the pictures in the book. I, I, I did a, I think I did a Google search for, you know, Star Wars weddings. And there are tons of them. You can find them all over, but I found this one really good picture. And uh, so I actually wrote to the people, you know, who I think it was on Flickr or something, you know, some site, and I wrote to them just wanting permission to reprint their picture. And she's like, oh, yeah, sure. That was fun. You know, we, we had a good time. We had a Star Wars based <laughs> wedding. Um, you know, she was sort of happy to include it uh, in, in the book, you know, that, you know, it's not like it's not like they, it's not like she acts like, you know, Princess Leia around the house or anything like that, I'm sure. But uh, it's just uh, so that's that's one level. But I think there's sort of a more profound uh, couple levels. One is that sort of our, our rituals are in our, you know, what we would call our maybe secularized societies. Um, 
film creates its own rituals film um so you know star wars again is sort of an example people will uh you know you can join jedi academies there's a there's a church of jediism you know now i mean yeah. tens of thousands of people you know talk about jediism as their as their religion and part of it's fun but then but then part of it's um it's it's fun and it's it's meaningful to people you know it's it's a place where people go and they 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 like they get in community right i mean the key thing is i found some other people who also like this film and we just have some fun we dress up we go to this certain place at a certain time and we behave in certain ways and use certain language right i mean that's that's classic religious stuff you know that's what we do we show up in certain places wearing certain clothes act in certain ways and um and and perform in, in particular kind of ways um I think there's that, but then it also kind of compels us to go out and, and do things. Uh, and I, I talk about this in the book. Uh, so after Lord of the Rings came out, um, you know, this is pretty well documented. The New York, New Zealand tourist uh, industry saw an enormous spike, something like a 50% spike in tourism after Lord of the Rings came out. Um, right. Cause, cause, you know, forget that J.R. Tolkien was a, uh, you know, a professor in England in mid mid 20th century and uh, writing a fantasy book about Middle Earth. Um, Lord of the Rings movie took it and projected Middle Earth onto New Zealand. So mm. now New Zealand is Middle Earth, right? So people people who see the story want to go to New Zealand, right? I mean, it, partly it's, you know, beautiful scenery and, and the, the film does a good job of showing the scenery of New Zealand, but people want to go to Middle Earth as well. They, they go to, there's a hobbit town there, uh, people want to go see those locations, not just because they're beautiful. Some people are because it's, yeah, it's beautiful mountains there. But a lot of people are like, this is where they actually filmed Lord of the Rings, right? And this is where Frodo was. And this is where Bilbo was. This is, you know, sort of the sacred ground uh, that happens to it, to these spaces. So space gets reconstructed. And you can find this, um, all of our, I've written a couple other kind of shorter essays on this kind of phenomenon, these kind of pilgrimage, uh, movie-induced pilgrimages that, that happen. So people, uh, a movie is filmed in a certain place, people will go to this place and, and, and want to see where it was filmed. And it becomes, you know, very much like a pilgrimage and people feel they're on a kind of sacred ground, a sacred space. Um, I, I love it. Yeah, and I was like, yeah. I, I just went in the book and I found that uh, the st- the presiding over by Darth Vader of the wedding on page 156 yeah. of the book. I love it. It's so cool. Um, quick qu- question. Do you ever get pushback from people who say, uh, who hear you saying religion and film are alike and think that you're like minimizing one or the other? Have you ever gotten any, any pushback on this? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's funny, less and less so. Um, you know, I first started kind of thinking about and writing about some of these ideas um, really 20 years ago. And, you know, in the academy anyway, things have, things have really changed a lot um, in that time. There's just been, you know, especially in film, it's, you know, these past 20 years have been significant in the idea that, you know, co- courses on religion and film are, are pretty standard now in, in, in a lot of places. Um, writings on religion and film, you know, the American Academy of Religion have, has, you know, very popular sections on religion and film and even the sort of standard, you know, study of Islam or, or study of Hebrew Bible uh, kind of sections that the AAR and SBL will have um, sections on film, you know, regularly. So it's really become uh, a legitimate area to study. So, so in that sense, less, I don't have as much pushback anymore in, in the academic kinds of worlds. Um, I do have it, you know, some of these ideas I've sort of done in public settings, I've shared in more public settings. And there are definitely people who sort of say, oh, you know, it, it, it's not the same, you know, it doesn't compare, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't compare these things. And I, I do get a little bit of that. Um, the one thing I will say, you know, my own pushback towards it is that, you know, the more I look at films and uh, bodies within films and the reactions to come, and the more I look at religious uh, rituals uh, through history, the more it's just the real difference is that 
religious rituals are multi-sensual, right? They're so much more appealing to the body, right? You can smell and you can taste and you can hear and you can touch all these things within a, uh, within a religious ritual that you can't do. It, it still remains an audio-visual medium. Uh, films still remain an audio-visual medium. Um, you bring your bodies to the cinema and your bodies are moved as well. There's something going on with, you know, I think proprioception, interioception, but, um, but for the most part, it's, it's, they're kind of dull. All of our so-called multimedia is really dull by comparison to ritual. I mean, ritual is this multifaceted affair where you're, you know, you're, you're doing all these things with your senses. You're touching things, you're smelling things, you're tasting things. It, you're touching other bodies around you. You get up and you move together at certain points. Um, so ritual is, you know, still so much more embodied a practice than than cinema is. Even if even if we're bored, you know, our modern world has sort of made us bored by some of the old rituals. Um, you know, there's some some new ones. I think religious rituals being invented. Why right? you know I think why Pentecostalism has been so. Um, widespread around the world in, in recent years, because it, it allows people to do things with their bodies that mm. some of the old rituals, the old rituals didn't. Um, so I, I think uh, there's a certain impoverishment in cinema when you compare it to a religious ritual. Um, not that I'm going to stop going to the movies, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, Brent, different. earlier you mentioned that you can see yourself moving in new directions as a scholar. Let's take a little bit of time and talk about where you are personally headed and maybe to preview for your colleagues what they can expect from your work in the next several years? Yeah, so I'm doing a, just at the start of a, of a book, I, I did a, a few years back, I did a book called um, A History of Religion and Five and a Half Objects. And uh, there I go through sort of five sets of objects, uh, stones, crosses, incense, drums and bread. I look at how these show up in religious traditions around the world that, you know, they're not, not universal, but it's sort of striking how many different traditions have rituals and stories about stones and the place of stones in people's lives. Um, uh, things like that. So I've been real interested in this human object interaction. Uh, so my next book is in some ways kind of a, not a sequel at all to that, but, uh, but taking off in that idea even more. So it's, uh, at this point, it's called a, a spiritual, the spiritual life of dolls. Mm. Um, and so I'm interested in, in dolls and, and really kind of a, a large perspective of dolls. I'm actually going to start with sort of robotics and artificial intelligent uh, robotics. Um, and then go back into a history of, of humankind. And this is, it will touch on religious studies, but it's also kind of there's a lot of archaeology. There's a lot of evolutionary biology. Uh, a lot of history in it. Um, it's kind of a big history thing, but it but it, it rethinks the human relationship with dolls. Um, these kind of three dimensional figures that look human in some way or another. That's kind of how I'm defining it. So that might be a a puppet, a marionette, a mannequin, um, a, a robot. You know, certain kinds of robots. Um, and that that humans engage with and interact with in a variety of ways. So I'm interested in the ways that we use things outside of ourselves uh, to socialize us, to uh, ritualize with. Um, and the the idea ultimately is that these these dolls teach us things. They teach us, you know, there's talking dolls, there's walking dolls, there's um, different dolls for different different purposes. And so they teach us things like uh, how to, how to talk, how to walk, how to behave. Certainly, you know, gender is a huge dimension uh, to it all. They socialize us into ways of being, right? We have our, we have our tea, tea ceremonies with our dolls and things like that. But then they also teach us how to grieve. Um, and uh, so we have, we have uh, examples more and more of dolls being used in nursing homes and um, just their, you know, Again, it's this people know it's not real, just like people know Star Wars isn't real. And yet there's there's something else going on within our bodies that is making us act, you know, as if these are real. And so people so people in nursing homes will be given these certain dolls and these dolls have little different functions to them. They'll sort of purr and they'll kind of vibrate and, and sort of react uh, back and uh, and it, it's it's curing depression, it's curing loneliness, it's curing feelings of isolation, it's helping people out, um, 
and uh, some interested in these kinds of ways that they they soothe us. Um, the, these objects soothe us, and they and they help us to. Uh, sorry, I think I said before they help us to grieve as well. People will take dolls, uh, especially uh, women who have lost children in childbirth or um, or uh, miscarriages, and they have these dolls called real baby dolls and they look very, they're silicone, you know, things and, and painted very realistically. And uh, people, usually women, there are some examples of men, but usually women um, will take them and carry them around with them for some time after they've lost a baby. And it helps them sort of greet through this process, this kind of surrogate thing. So they're really, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's it's Barbie, but it's it's there's some very I think profound ways in which dolls have shaped us as humans and continue to shape us. Have shaped us throughout you know, um, throughout you know uh, hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. We we find you know examples of doll like uh, creatures going way back uh, into our human evolution. Um, so interested in the ways we've continue to connect with these with these objects and how they how we do, we don't just make them they make us is really kind of the idea wow that is utterly beautiful do you have a timeline for that project well next, so next year I, I just got a acls fellowship so i'll take all of 2021 off and just write for the whole year so i'm hoping to be done um you know a year year and a year and a half from now finish writing probably published sometime in 20 two i suppose would be the would be the idea late in 22 wow fantastic um well dr brent plate i have really enjoyed this conversation you've illuminated so many concepts and examples for me personally within your book religion and film i'm also excited by your other stuff and also to check out some of your other books another project that you did blasphemy art that offends looks particularly interesting for me personally um can you tell people who are listening, where they can find you if they want to follow the progress of your work in the coming years? Sure, yeah. I've got a, uh, I've got a website, uh, sbrentplate.net. And then uh, I'm on Twitter and, and Facebook and like uh, Twitter at, um, what is it, splate1. Awesome. I think it's my Twitter place. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, I will link for listeners those those links that you mentioned in the show notes. So if anybody out there is listening, you can just go underneath this episode in the show notes of your podcast player, and you can directly click on those links to be connected directly to um, Dr. Brent Plate. Well, thank you so much for coming on Classical Ideas. I'm glad we were finally able to do this. I know we've been talking about it for a long time, and it's an awesome uh, opportunity to finally make it happen. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks for your work and uh, and the podcast and look forward to more episodes. Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is composed and performed by Derek Strybick. You can find his music at www.wearewarmmusic.com. If you like this show, please rate it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can email me at classicalideas at outlook.com. Or find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash classicalideaspodcast. Thanks so much for listening.